Welcome. Welcome to the Vision Channel tonight on Merge. Tonight I'm probably going to be short, but I want to get to the point. There's two things that God placed in my heart. One is to teach, but one is to address. And I believe that God wants me to address this. One of the first things I'm going to talk about, I'm going to address and not teach. I'm going to teach on something else, but I want to make sure that people hear what I'm getting ready to say, that God put it on my heart. Uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is offense, is the word offense. And I truly believe that this is, this word offense, it makes people defensive all the time. Whether you've been hurt, whether you have been rejected, whether you have been uh, ostracized or criticized, whether something had transpired in your life that will cause the offense. Everything in life, oftentimes, when it don't go your way, this is one of the avenues, one of the doors that open, that prohibit people from elevating prohibit people from going to the next level, prohibit people from functioning in the grace that God has predestined for their life, it is the offense. It is being offended. And oftentimes we become so offended so easily. And the enemy will use offense to stop you from going to where God can take you. And, and let me say this. I want to express this. Because the enemy causes the offense so that only so that he can accuse you. Because remember, he is the accuser. So he waits for an individual to function from the realm of their flesh, to function out of their emotions, to function out of anger, to function out of hate, to function out of bitterness, to function out of wrath, to function out of uh, anger. You know, anger and offense goes hand in hand. If you look in Ephesians, Chapter 20, chapter 4 and verse 26, it says, Be ye angry, but sin not. Let not the sun go down on your wrath. But verse 27 said, And neither this thing will give a foothold or a place to the devil. So it is anger that often opens the doors for offense. Because it said, Let not the sun go down. So there is a time period that God allows each one of us to release the anger because it said you can be angry, but it says sit not, let not the wrath because anger, if you hold it long enough, if you go past a certain amount of time, then it festers, it develops, and it becomes wrath. And that thing, that thing, the very wrath of man, according to James, I think it's in chapter 1, where it says in verse um, 18, 19, and 20, it said, Be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to wrath. For the wrath of man, it works not the righteousness of God. The wrath of man, it works not the righteousness of God. So the second that you allow that time period that God has allotted for you to cast your care upon him because he cares for you, but yet you hold on to it. God is telling you to cast it, but oftentimes we don't want to cast it so we keep it and we become an offense. We keep it because we have been offended. And God gets offended when you get offended because we don't trust God through the process because you were offended. I'm going to say this. One of the greatest prophets that we know in the Old Testament the one who had a staff that he threw down his staff and the staff became a serpent. That very one, Moses. Moses was one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament. He, he stood in the presence of God. He brought down the Ten Commandments. He fasted 40 days and nights. I, I just want you to see that the Bible said that Moses was the meekest man in the earth. But Moses... And I'm trying not to go too far talking about offense because I, I want you to see something. I, I want you to see something, how God explained it and how God expressed it to me. Because Moses, even though he was the meekest man in the earth, Moses got offended 
came from the presence of God. God told Moses, I need you to speak to the rock. But Moses never spoke to the rock. He struck the rock. And God was trying to teach his people to come into a new dispensation. A new dispensation that you don't have to use your hands in this season. All you need to do is open your mouth. And Moses used his hand in the place where God wanted him to speak because he got offended. He was offended by what they said. And because of the offense, there are two things that happened. I want you to see this. Not only did Moses miss the promised land, because that's one of the things that we said. He missed the promised land. But why was God so upset? Because Moses made this one mistake. For one, he carried the spirit of offense. That's one. Two, that Moses, God used Moses to establish the priesthood. This Leviticus priesthood that Aaron, his brother, the Levite, was now established. Now, this had always been an issue with Moses from the beginning because when Moses saw a man offended or killing or whooping one of the Egyptians, one of the um, um, Israelites, Moses killed the man and hit him in the sand. That spirit of anger, sometimes it waits, it hides. And Moses now had been cleaned by God. Moses now had been purified by God when God told him to take off your shoes for the ground that you stand on is holy. You can't stand in God's presence and not be holy. You can't stand in God's ground and not be holy. It's impossible. And holiness started from the place where God gave man authority in his feet. It went from his feet to the crown of his head. And sanctification took place with Moses. But listen, God was so upset with Moses because he got offended. I told you one offense carries a spirit. It's not a natural action or emotion. Offense is a spirit. Offense makes you blind. And this is what took place with Moses. And I want you to see something. Because Moses allowed a different spirit now to come into the priesthood. And because he allowed that spirit of offense to come into the priesthood, God told him not only you are not going to make it, but your brother Aaron, who didn't even do anything at the time, Aaron is not going to make it. I'm getting rid of that entire priesthood, that entire generation. Why? Because offense came. And God said, I cannot afford the spirit of offense to trickle back down through the bloodline so you can be a part of the priesthood. It was the spirit of offense. When you, when you look at one of the greatest, Jesus said, in the Old Testament, Moses, he was a great prophet. But when you start looking from this aspect, this aspect, this aspect, we see John the Baptist, who Jesus said was the greatest prophet. And I, I want you to see, I want you to see the, the connection and, and the collaboration with prophets. Moses was one of the greatest Old Testament prophets, but Jesus said John the Baptist was the greatest prophet. <laughs> and John the Baptist, the one who baptized Jesus, the one who said that I'm not even worthy to even lash in his shoes, but yet he was able to identify who Jesus was when he came. He said, behold, the Lamb of God. He had understanding of who the lamb was before the offense. He baptizes him and the heavens open. And his father, God, the one that John the Baptist was serving, said, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So John the Baptist knew who he was before the offense. It's only when John the Baptist was in prison. Now, all of a sudden, because of his present condition, and see, sometimes offense will make you forget who Christ is. Make you forget who the Redeemer is. Make you forget who the Savior is. Make you forget. See, I keep telling there are many different things that follow the spirit of offense. John the Baptist is in prison and he's offended. How do we know that John the Baptist was offended? Because Jesus started teaching on offense because of John the Baptist's issue, because of John the Baptist's circumstance. He started teaching on offense. And what God is trying to teach us tonight, 
just what he wanted me to express is you have to be careful when people do things against you, when people start talking about you, it's coming against you. Only the spirit of offense is knocking at your door. And the Bible said John the Baptist told his disciples, go and see if he's the one. Well, John the Baptist knew that he was the one. But it's only trouble. When trouble came, he got offended. And I hate to say this. He died in offense. He died. He opened the door to offense. God protected John the Baptist. And I know what he said. I must decrease that you must increase. He was talking about giving Jesus his reverential place in the earth realm. It wasn't that he had to die. But offense opened the door to where God stopped protecting him because he carried the wrong spirit. He was offended. And you have to be careful about offense because offense is going to come. They're going to come. Trials are going to come. Afflictions are going to come. But it's, it's trying to open the door in you and not outside of you. It want to open the door in you so the spirit of offense can come in you. And once people are offended... Any little thing makes them offended. Whether the weather pattern changed, whether the time changed, whether the seasons change, whether the job change, whether the churches change, they are offended by everything. So if you listen to what I'm saying today, you can guarantee you can go to work and find it. You can go to church and find it. You can look in your own house and find it. If you do a self inventory on yourself, you may find that the spirit of offense is there. That's the same spirit that came to Christ on the cross. When the same people that he said, I came to save you. I came to save. I came to my own, but they knew me not. Jesus knew that he could not get offended. Even the very apostles that he had. He said, listen, I, all of y'all are going to leave me, but God is going to be with me. When he came to Peter, James, and John in the garden of Gethsemane, because they were offended. Listen, Jesus got upset. He said, can you not pray with me at least one hour? The spirit of offense was trying to knock at the door. He's on the cross and the Pharisees and the Sadducees looked up at him and said, listen, he saved others. Let him see him save himself. Listen, listen, listen to what I'm saying. At that moment, Jesus, if you look at it, the very first thing that he regurgitates it's Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Listen, any time what kills the spirit of offense is you telling God you forgive them. Father, I forgive them, for they know not what they do. And see, offense keeps you at that dimension, keeps you in the same place, keeps you in the same realm. That offense, because I'm going to tell you why. Because when you get offended... The enemy has legal grounds to every blessing, every promotion, everything in your life stops. It's at a standstill. It's on hold. Why? Because you are offended and God can't move in your life because the spirit of offense is connected to your life. Jesus said, I forgive them. You look in Acts chapter 7, one of the most profound revelations in Acts chapter 7 is with Stephen. The Bible said that Stephen was full of wisdom and full of the Holy Spirit. He was full of wisdom. I, I want you to see this. And Stephen is going through scriptures with those who are persecuting him. They're picking up stones because it said they gnashed with their teeth. They were so upset with Stephen for telling them Jesus Christ was the Lord and Savior. He was the Redeemer. He was the one that resurrected. It was him. And he came. And they were offended by it. And the Bible said they took him out of the city. And Paul, Saul, who, was, who would become Paul later, he was the one that took their coats. But yet they're stoning Stephen. And in the midst of them stoning Stephen, Stephen said, listen, he said, I see Christ. The only time that we ever see scripturally that Christ is standing. He's standing because he sees somebody that's being afflicted, that's being persecuted, and even at the point of death, but they were not offended. He stands up. He said, I see Christ standing at the right hand of God. He's seen it. God allowed a door, a portal to be opened to let him see. And he said, give this not a charge to them. Don't charge this against them. And Jesus stood up because he knew how to handle offense. 
most people don't know that rejection causes offense. You have to know how to handle offense that when you're rejected, when you're ostracized, when you're shunned. And let me say this to some people, because some people, I'm talking to people that are in church, that you're not a part of the status quo, that you're not a part of the clique. And it seems like you're all by yourself, watch this, in church. There is no love. And everybody seems that if they have called you out, left you out, but it's great that they left you out. I've learned this. If anyone leaves you out, it only means God has included you in. But you have to be careful with offense. Even David being rejected by his father, being rejected by his brothers in 1 Samuel chapter 17, that his brother said, we know why you came to the battle. Because of your naughtiness, who have you left these sheep with? Those few sheep with, they embarrassed him in front of an entire army. Humiliated him. And David had integrity. And watch what David said. Never replied, never responded. The Bible said David turned from his own family and turned to another. And sometimes when rejection comes, when embarrassment comes, when humiliation comes, it's time to turn. You have to turn to another. You have to turn to the one that's a savior. Turn to the one who's a redeemer. Turn to the, in other words, he becomes your Jehovah Sikhanu, the God of your righteousness. You have to turn because of this offense. So in this season, no matter what transpires, no matter what takes place, you have to be careful of offense because offense would make you think that everybody else desires to hurt you. Offense closes your heart. Not even God couldn't get in. You, not even God could get to your heart because of the offense. This is a season where you have to be careful. And some people I'm talking to are offended. You offended. Right in church, you offended. And that's what the enemy wanted. Let, let me tell you one of the greatest strategies, one of the greatest strategies of the kingdom of darkness is to have leaders to offend you. To have people that you love, that you trust, that you see, that you talk to every Sunday or every Wednesday or Thursday, whatever the respective day that you have, it's now to have your leaders to offend And watch what happened. I've seen this in my time in Christendom. Is they leave the church and they leave God completed. That was the main assignment right before the day of elevation. Not elevation in the church, but elevation in God. So the enemy had to do something against you to get you away from God. And it's called, watch this, offense is hidden in church hurt. You've been hurt by the church. So you associate the church with God. What the church did to you. And then we get offended because the church hurt us and not God. But we turn our backs on God because the church hurt us. It is one of the greatest deception of one of the kingdom of darkness is to offend you, to hurt you because of the leaders that was over you. Oh. I've seen it. I've experienced it myself. So I'm telling you how offense works. I'm not telling you without a testimony. I had to go through some church hurts. But even though they were church hurts, I went back to the healer. <laughs> he heals of any kind of hurt. As a matter of fact, he said, let me, let me give you one of the secrets. Let me give you one of the secrets of the kingdom. That if your heart is broken, the Bible said Jesus is close to what? A broken heart and a contrite spirit. So guess what? So when it comes down to your heart being broken, this is where Jesus become even closer. 
Don't allow the offense to stop your elevation. I don't know who that's for, but God wanted me to address offense. And that's going to be the thing that's going to cap you off. That's going to be the thing that stop you from going higher. And the as possession of everything, every promise, he got legal grounds because you were offended. It was something that God was trying to teach Job. That after his kids had died, after his cattle was gone, after his camel were gone, after they took his servant and his land was gone, after all the things that transpired, God was trying to get Job and Satan was trying to get Job to be offended by God. Why? He said, if you just remove curse you to your face, person, why? Because they were offended. What did Job's wife say? Because she was offended. Why don't you just curse God and die? Look at where the spirit of offense lived. It lived in that person. And you don't see Job's wife again until Job chapter 42. His wife didn't die. She was just offended. And God took her, blotted her out into chapter 42 until she was able to have children, until Job came out of his dilemma because of the offense. All right, that's the first thing. I wanted to get offense out of the way. So what I'm going to talk about tonight, I'm going to read... I'm going to read I'm going to read in Mark chapter 4 and I'm 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 not going to highlight everything in these passages of scriptures but I'm going to read it just to give us some kind of clarity some kind of understanding I'm going to talk about a topic tonight that um that you're probably going to have to go deeper, but I want you to just follow me so that I can give you clarity on certain things. I'm going to bring scriptures. I'm going to highlight some scriptures just so we can get a better understanding and some kind of clarity of what I'm going to express tonight because I truly want to express one of the things that I'm, I'm okay. All right. And this is what I'm going to say. I'm going to read this, so just stay with me. Mark chapter 4, I'm going to start at verse 35. Verse 35. And the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, Let us pass over unto the other side. And when they had sent away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship. And there was also with him other little ships. And there arose a great storm of wind, and the waves beat into the ship so that it was now full. And he was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow. And they awaked him and said unto him, Master, carest thou not that we perish? And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm and he said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And they feared exceedingly and said one to another, What manner of man is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? Now I'm going to talk about a, uh, a subject tonight. That it's not common. It's not common. It's not part of our. our um, I'm, I want to make sure I use the right word. It's not common to our church protocol or curriculum. This this is not about prosperity. This this is not about sowing. This is not about um, the anointing. This is not about favor, but tonight is a night where we got to understand this. 
and I'm probably going to reiterate this. I want to reiterate this verse again. And when they had sent away the multitude, they went even in there was in the ship. And there was also with them other little ships. Verse 37. And there arose a great storm of wind. And the waves beat into the ship. So that it was now full. So my topic tonight is on the marine kingdom. It's going to be on the marine kingdom. And this is a one of the greatest times, I guess, to introduce the marine kingdom to some that may know where it is, some that may experience the marine kingdom. I'm going to start off from Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, the Bible said, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. And, there, and, say, and the spirit moved. The spirit moved upon the face of what? Why did the spirit move upon the face of the waters? The only thing that was here was water. You don't see in creation how God created trees. And on the seventh day, God created water. No, the water was here first. And everything that God created, it came out of that kingdom. So the firmaments, the heavens, came out of the water. Why did the Holy Spirit move upon the face of the waters? What was in the water that had the Holy Spirit to subdue it? Now, I know this may be far-fetched. It may be hard. It may be challenging. And it may be difficult to believe. But... I'm going to take you through some scriptures tonight, and you can do some research and studying it on your own time. I'm going to make sure that we kind of get an understanding of it. I'm just going to give you the foundation of what God placed in my heart to teach the body of Christ. Now, I know I'm talking about this, and I only want to use this as a backdrop because they say there was a storm. And out of all the storms, Jesus is on the ship. What would make him rebuke the wind? But yet tell the sea to peace be still. What was in the sea that was in opposition against Jesus? Why would he have to tell it peace to be still? What was there? Now, we are in a season now, naturally. We are in a season now, naturally. And I'm going to tell you about some of my encounters. We, were, we are in a season now, naturally. Naturally. We call it storm season. Right now, there are hurricanes in the Gulf. There are hurricanes that went to Maine. There are hurricanes that went to certain countries. Right now, as we speak, and every year, where do these hurricanes come from? They come from almost the coast of Africa. So every year, we don't think about it. We just prepare for it. We, we just prepare for what is coming. We know the storm season is coming because this is what the meteorologists tell us. This is what the newscasters and they tell us. This is storm season. Last season we had these many hurricanes. Last, do you know that water covers over 70% of the earth? If it covers over 70% of the earth, do you see how powerful this kingdom is? Well, why would God say when he created man, take dominion over the fish of the sea, over the fowl of the air, and over everything that creepeth upon the earth? He gives man dominion and authority over three different dimensions. Why would he say that he had to take dominion over the fish of the sea? What was in the sea that Adam would have to subdue and obey? What, what was in that sea? So let me give you a couple of scriptures that we're going to go to. I talked about the sea. I talked about this storm. I talked about how it, and, and let me, okay, let me, get, let me get to some scriptures first. Let me get to some scriptures first. I want you to go to um, Ezekiel chapter 26. So let's go to verse 16. Ezekiel chapter 26, verse 16. 
You know, I know this is um Normally I don't even use my phone. I just tell you other scriptures, I just give the scriptures. It's crazy. I just um <laughs> And this this is uh, this is just proof text. I'm um, just is just proof text to show you different things to explain it to you. I'm going to explain it to you tonight so you can get your research and you get your study on. And this is what it said. Ezekiel chapter 26 in verse 16. It said, "Then all the princes of the sea." I'm going to say that again. Then all the princes of the sea shall come down from their thrones and lay away their robes and put out their broad and garments and they shall clothe themselves with trembling and they shall sit upon the ground and they shall tremble at every moment and be astonished at thee. Watch this. And this is where you got, because I know some commentaries Try to use it as merchants, but you have to go deeper. This is the stuff that you have to ask God about. You have to go beyond the commentaries because the commentaries will only use their common sense. This is something that has to be birthed in the spirit realm. So it said the common ad, I'm going to take you to, to more scriptures. It said, and all the princes. Now, I know you may be thinking about a person that's a prince, but in Daniel chapter 10, when the angel finally breaks through after the 21 days, the 24th day, he comes to talk to Daniel. He said, what well, took me so long that I had to deal with the, the prince of Gersia, prince of Gersia, prince of Gersia. It wasn't a man. It was a prince of palady. The Bible said that Satan is the what of this world? He is the prince of of this world. Even Jesus, he said, listen, the prince of this world coming, but he'll find nothing in me. So we're not talking about common men. We're talking about principalities. They are kings, and yet they were in the sea. I know it's hard to believe. I know it's hard to believe. If there was no marine kingdom, why would God dedicate Job chapter 41 to an entire chapter, he would have dedicated it to one marine agent. The Bible said that Satan is not the king of pride. It said Leviathan is the king of pride. He is the very king, the Bible said. He dedicated one entire chapter to the marine kingdom. Everybody, if you don't know who Leviathan is, go to Job chapter 41. There is nothing that can break him, break his scales. And I'm going to tell you this, watch, watch how crazy this is in today's terminology. Because when you look at the illustration that Job chapter 41, that God is introducing the marine kingdom to Job to give him some kind of understanding of how this kingdom functions and how it operates, they create a movie in Hollywood. And the movie they create depicts the same illustration that God gave us in Job chapter 41. The movie that they, put, they, they, they created is called Godzilla. He, where does Godzilla live? I know it sounds far-fetched, but if you read, if you read everything, the very details of Leviathan life is the same thing they created for Godzilla's life. He comes out of the waters. There's nothing that can break his scales. Why, why would God dedicate an entire chapter to the marine kingdom, to Leviathan? If Leviathan wasn't real, and God gives us, and we get an understanding, an understanding, Lord, we get an understanding of exactly how he looks in real life. How Leviathan looks, they just gave it the name Godzilla because they created a God out of him. Okay, go to Revelation, Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. I know when you got to introduce... Topics that are is not commonly known, not commonly expressed. Revelation chapter 17. And I'm going to read this, 17.
Revelation chapter 17, I'm going to read verse 1. And it said, And there came one of the seven angels, which had seven vials, and talked with me, saying unto me, talking to John the Revelator, Come hither, and I will show thee the judgment of the great horde that sit upon many waters. Verse 3. Watch this, verse 2. With whom the kings of the earth had committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth had been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Where did that queen sit? Where did this great whore sit? She sat upon many waters. Okay? I'm only giving you proof text to show you something. I'm trying to take it slow before I go over boards. I'm trying my best because I'm trying to give you some kind of foundation so that you can understand it. So, this is one of the things that God illustrated to me. When you're dealing with the marine kingdom, they have a lot of wisdom. They have a lot of understanding. They're very wise. And some of you have already been indoctrinated or already uh, um, um, been a part of it, been initiated into the marine kingdom. I'll give you a prime example. Have you ever seen a mall? And in the mall, they had a wishing well? And you put money in a wishing well, or you took money out of the wishing well. That's something that the marine kingdom established. It established now so you being initiated. Okay. The marine kingdom, the marine kingdom is a kingdom that controls the economy. Everything has to be imported and exported. It must come. They troll the very economy. Okay. If you go to Ezekiel chapter 28, there was a king of Tyre. The king was Satan. But the prince of Tyre had all the merchandise, had all the wisdom, and they sat upon the sea. And God was getting ready to judge the prince and the king. Because they control all the commerce coming in. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 28. Go to the 14th verse when God started he start ministering and said and telling Ezekiel exactly what's getting ready to take place. When it came down to the prince of Tyre and the king of Tyre is two different people. God was getting ready to bring judgment because they control the commerce from the sea. I got it. It is something that we indoctrinate our children with. We indoctrinate our children, which means initiate them. Have you ever seen the little innocent little cartoon called The Little Mermaids? Well, if you do any kind of, just watch, just watch, Lord, just watch The Little Mermaid. Why would the octopus give people their dreams, give people their promises, give people their desires, and then after they fulfill their desire, then she come back to take their souls. Those little imps that look like she had with eyes, she had stolen her souls because she indoctrinated them. And the Lord told me, we have so many people that have enthroned their daughters because their beds, sheets are covered with it. Their bathrooms are covered with it. Their pillows are covered with it. Even now when you start looking at TV, why do you think they have something called um, uh, what's, the, what's the movie that they call um, Aquaman and the Marine Kingdom where did they get that technology from <sighs> they got it from the Marine Kingdom now I'm just going to go just a little deeper just a little deeper There are spirits called incubus and succubus. They are called spiritual husbands and spiritual wives. Have you ever had a dream to where you couldn't say anything of the dream, but you were being attacked and you couldn't wake up out of the dream? You were being attacked? It's part of the marine kingdom. Let me tell you, because... The marine kingdom is like this, and I want to explain it. I'm going to explain it from this place. I'm going to say something that's going to be real, so just stay with me. Have you ever had something called a wet dream? Have you ever even heard about it? To where it appears 
that the dream was so real that in the dream there was something that took place after the dream and you woke up or you heard somebody say they woke up, this dream was so real? Or have you ever felt like you were being harassed in your sleep or having sex in your sleep or in your dreams? This is part of the marine kingdom. You're being initiated. So now you have a spiritual husband and you have a spiritual wife. I know I'm saying something that is, that is beyond, but this is how you establish it. This is how this established in that kingdom. And then now everything in your life, because you've been initiated in this kingdom, they fight you. And anybody you try to talk to, anybody you get involved with, they'll fight their relationship. Why? Because they believe that you belong to them. You become their own personal property in the marine kingdom. I'll give you this prime example. Everybody know about Moses. We all know who Moses is. We all know. Let me ask you this question. Go to Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3, and I'm going to go back to Moses. Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 3. I'm going to start at verse 1. In the tenth year of the tenth month, in the twelfth day of the month, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, set thy face against Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and prophesy against him and against all. Speak and say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against thee, Pharaoh, king of Egypt, the great dragon that lie in the midst of his rivers which have said, my river is my own, and I have made it for myself. I'm going to say that again. There was a great dragon, in verse 3, that lies in the midst of the rivers. I started here to go back to Exodus. In Exodus, why was one of the first signs that God told Moses, go to the river? Go to the river, and when you go to the river, it said, now I want you to pour out the water that's in the thing. And it said, and the water shall become blood. What was that a sign of? I just read to you in Exodus, e Ezekiel chapter 29 and verse 3, that there was this dragon that lied in the midst of the waters. So it was a sign of Pharaoh because Pharaoh served the dragon that was in the waters. He served that dragon, and it was a sign that the dragon was now dead. Why do you think they threw the children into the waters? When Moses was born, they were sacrificing those children to this dragon. It was part of the marine kingdom. And whether you believe it or not, whether you know it or not, this is one of the things that God expressed to me. He expressed to me when they used to have the Kappa Beast party in Galveston. The marine kingdom is a kingdom that entices you with perversion. They entice you to open doors. They, they are seducing spirits. Watch this. This is what God explained to me. He explained this to me. He said, people, see, I, if I go to, I, I'm trying to stay just from the foundation so that people can get it. So I, it, I know it's a, lot of, it's a lot to swallow, but I'm giving you context I'm giving and telling you exactly where you can go to find the majority of stuff so you'll get an understanding so you can go back and study it on your own time. I normally don't go to scriptures like this, but God told me to explain it this way tonight so that people can come into it and understand. you got to come higher. There's a place and there's a, there's a place in the spirit realm that God desires us to be so he can unfold and reveal all of this stuff unto us because he's talking about this kingdom. And God began to explain to me about the marine kingdom because they're seductive. Let me tell you how they work. God was telling me, even when it came to high school, 
God was telling me that most people, when they skipped, they call it singing skip day. Where would they go back to? They would always go to the beach. They didn't understand that they were going to the beach, but they were initiating themselves. When they went into those waters, they were being a part of the marine kingdom. And the Kappa Beach Party. People would come to the Kappa Beach Party half naked or less than half naked. They would reveal everything. Watch the secret. Men and women, watch the secret. Watch the secret on how they opened the doors to the marine kingdom in their own life. Remember Jesus said, if a man so happens to look at a woman lustfully, he's already committed the fornication. I just read to you in Revelation chapter 17, they said the kings and the priests of the earth committed fornication. Fornication does not come with touch all the time. Fornication comes with just looking. So just because they looked, the marine kingdom brought them into a place of fornication. And then they committed fornication and they had spiritual husbands and spiritual wives. And they brought those spirits, those imaginations. The greatest battle that you'll ever have in this kingdom is through your imagination. If you cannot guard your imagination, the marine kingdom got you. This is why Jesus said, casting down every imagination and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And bring back into the captive every thought under the obedience of Christ. Because this is how things are established in this kingdom. So why, when they got to the Red Sea... God said, I'm going to have my vengeance against Pharaoh. Do you honestly think that God had forgot about what they did to the children when they threw them into the river, when they dedicated them to the marine kingdom? No. That's why God allowed Pharaoh and his chosen chariots to come so far and use that very thing against them, the water kingdom. That's how he got everything. Okay. The ten plagues and every plague it was against every God. I'll have my vengeance against the gods of Egypt. So God released plagues to every God that they served. So the last thing that God did, since you threw my children into the kingdom, the marine kingdom, now I'll have your chosen children since my children were chosen. Now I'll get rid of your chosen chariots. And guess what? You don't have any defense because I'm going to use the same thing you use against my children, the marine kingdom. Why do you think, okay, why do you think, what would cause Jesus to choose fishermen? What would make him go to the sea to get fishermen and then tell them, I'll call you fishers of men? What would make them, what would make Peter, watch this, what would make Peter be so depressed because he toiled all night long and didn't catch fish. What would make him not even have a desire to go back out when he was a fisherman? Fishermen have bad days. What would cause them? the marine kingdom has a way of depressing you and oppressing you? And Jesus tells Peter, go back out. Let me reestablish what I gave mankind from the beginning, dominion over the fish. Go back out and launch into the deep. He launches, he goes back out, and Jesus tells him to let down your net. I'm giving you this authority that I gave Adam over the fish of the sea, over the marine kingdom. I know I just said some things that are, but I, I'm giving you scriptures according to it. If you look back in the book of Revelation, where does the dragon come from? He comes out of the water. Where does the beast come from? The beast comes out of the water. Now, I'm going to express um, one of my testimonies. When I uh, went to, and I, I have um, probably like um, maybe 17 witnesses, because it was 17 witnesses, 17 
of us that went to the Bahamas. So I understand the story about Jesus when he said, let us go to the other side. The entire other side was not about Decapolis, which was the city. That entire city, the entire story of them going to the other side was about a man where there was six, three to 6,000 demons. And he said, for my name is Legion, for we are many. This entire trip, entire trip, entire, I want you to see this. This entire trip going to the other side was to set one individual free. This individual was bound. The Bible said when Jesus finally gets to the other side, the man comes from the tombs, falls to the ground, worship Jesus. And Jesus asked them, asked them a question. What is your name? Legion, for we are many. And, and the demons are saying, suffer us not to leave the region. Can we go into the pigs? This is in Mark chapter 5 now. Demons leave the man, but go into the pigs. But where did the pigs run? Why didn't the pigs run back in the land? Why didn't the pigs run back to their owners? Why did the pigs run into the sea? They went back where they came from, from the marine kingdom. You see the fight that one individual had that was anointed by God because this one man became an evangelist and the marine kingdom knew that this man would be an evangelist. So they tried to stop him because what he was was the capitalist. The capitalist means 10, which means 10 cities. This man now had the authority after being released from the marine kingdom. He now possessed and took authority over 10 cities that's called the capitalist. My own experience, and I'm going to close it with this. This is why Jesus came walking on the water in the second storm. Because he was trying to show the authority that he had over the marine kingdom. If Jesus was the word, <laughs> the word still had authority over that kingdom. That's why he came walking. The word has authority over every element in the earth realm. If you just use the word properly, I guarantee you that the word works even with water. That's the first one of the first instructions that God gave. Everything came out of the water. The earth came out of the water. The firmness came out of the water. The animals came out of the water. Everything comes out of the water. Jesus came walk and Peter said, Lord, if it be you, bid me to come. Peter steps down on top of the water. A miracle. Can't say that's far-fetched. It's written in Scripture. It is written. He steps down, and the only thing that troubled him was the marine kingdom start raging the waters, and he lost his focus, and he began to sink. Listen to me. There's a reason. When you look at the Bermuda Triangle, how many planes or ships that was lost that was never found? No evidence of them even crashing in the world. There's no wreckage. There's not anything. Why are there portals at the end of the Bahamas that normally sink? There are sinkholes that draw everything down. Do some research and studying. So I'm going to give you my testimony about the Bahamas. I told you this story. I'm going to give you my testimony. One of my testimonies that we were getting ready to go to the Bahamas. I'm not going to give you all of it. I'm going to make this long story short. When I finally got to the Bahamas, finally, I should have gotten to the Bahamas at 1230 that day. I didn't get to the Bahamas until 9 o'clock that night. That's how much warfare that took place between my travel from the United States to the Bahamas. And the second that I got out of the cab and put my foot on the ground where we were staying, it almost looked like a tsunami was taking place. Because they knew that I had came there. And that entire trip, God began to reveal to me, remove the scales from my eyes, 
as Second King chapter six and verse seventeen say that when it came down to Elijah and his servant, his servant thought that because the army was coming after him, and Elijah said, Lord, remove the scales from his eyes. Show him they are more with us than against us. And God began to reveal to me, I saw things coming out of the waters that would not make natural sense to any believer. I saw a hydro spirit. You know what a hydro spirit is? It's the same spirit that's in the book of Revelation. With the seven heads and the ten horns. I saw dragons coming out of the waters in my state. I have 17 witnesses that can tell you about these experiences. And we took authority over the Marine Kingdom. Right now, today, we have witnesses about the warfare that took place. Why? Because the Bahamas is surrounded by water. Watch this now. Every year, every year, the Marine Kingdom wages war against countries, even against the United States. Why do you think that storms come and flood? I know you think that these are natural causes. No. Let me give you a name. I'll never forget last year in 2020. We had so many storms come back to back to back to back. And I remember the Lord telling me this. And I want you to go back and research the name I'm getting ready to tell you. And storms came back to back. And I heard this name for three days. Three days. I heard this name for three days. God was revived. He was telling me this for three days. The name was Poseidon. Go back and do your research. Study the name Poseidon. It's spelled P-O-S-E-I-D-O-N. Poseidon. And Poseidon is one of the gods under the water that controls tsunamis, hurricanes. Go research it. You can go to Webster, and it'll tell you what the name Poseidon is. It almost looked like the same god that was on the Little Mermaid. And the second that God revealed it to me, I saw a trident come. God was revealing to me his trident, and he was causing all the ruckus and the waves. And, and listen to me. Anytime, I, 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 see, I told you I work in Galveston, and we just had a storm just here recently, a storm that was 100 years old. It came around back on its anniversary date, and it wiped out Galveston, period. Why was it wiping out Galveston? It was wiping out Galveston because the Marine Kingdom needed more territory. They were losing ground, so the storm came. So when you look at storms that normally come and houses are flooded, cities are underwater, it's the Marine Kingdom trying to take authority in territory. Hear what I'm saying. Look at all the major events that took place scriptorially. Whether they take place in water, the Red Sea, the Jordan River. Look at all of these instances, the Genesaret River. Look at all of these instances that's in the waters. I just read all the scriptures that talked about waters, how Satan controlled the commerce, the economy. From the Marine Kingdom, they controlled the economy. One last revelation. Why would God, Jesus, tell Peter that in order to pay my taxes, go to the sea? The first fish you pull out because the marine kingdom controls the commerce. Listen, why do you think the Bible said the kingdoms of this world shall become the kingdoms of my God? What, kingdom do you th what kingdoms do you think he's talking about? You think he's talking about the United Kingdom? No. The Marine Kingdom is part of it. I just told you, if you go to Job chapter 41, it said Leviathan is the king of pride. So if you see people who's functioning from pride, guess who their king is? They're part of the Marine Kingdom. Listen, I just wanted to be simple to give you some kind of foundation. I didn't want to go off on the deep end. 
I just wanted to express the little what God shed on my heart to tell the believers, this is why you have to be careful of where you go. Water parks, slitter bomb, stuff like that. Let me give you one of the most profound revelations that God gave me. When um, I went to Africa, <laughs> and the Lord told me this. And there were some people that went to Africa with me. And when they came back, it was such a great, let me tell you something. I, I don't know where we get that we can go to a country, fly to a country that is controlled by principalities and powers, and then we can come back to the United States and we think that we are free. Listen, principalities don't have jurisdictions because they're spirits. One of the most profound things that God gave me, when I seen people almost losing their mind, churches go bananas and warfare break out, I asked God the question. I said, Lord, why? Why? What's going on? What's taking place? Why is all this taking place in these ministries and all of this and people going crazy and children want to kill? I said, why? What's taking place? And the Lord told me. He said they brought the fibers, the sand, the soil from that country back into this country, and they brought it in their house. And he explained it to me scriptorially this way. He said, why did you think that I told the apostles, whoever don't receive you, shake the dust off from your feet? It's evidence. It's evidence. I don't even want this on your feet because this will follow you. It will be worse than that city than Sodom and Gomorrah. And God told me they brought the evidence from that country back into that country. And then they brought it in their church in their house because it was soiled in their clothes. So when they go to water parks, why do you think in this season more kids drown than anything? More people are taken back by the sea. Why? Why is it in this time more ships sink? Why is it in this time, in this season, sharks attack surface? Why? And it's only in this season. Why do the hurricanes always come in this season? What is the purpose for the hurricane? Did you ever think about that? You ever think about storms coming and why they all come from the same place? Did you ever think about that? This is what I'm going to address to you. Before you make an assumption, before you make a judgment, before you say this individual is crazy, this is what I need you to do. I want you to ask God. See, it'll bypass me. Ask God, is the marine kingdom real? Watch this. Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. If you call upon me, I will answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. It says, if you ask, seek and knock. For everyone that asketh shall receive it. He that seeketh shall find it. And he that knocketh, it shall be open unto them. It's asking, seeking. James chapter 1 and verse 5. Those that need wisdom, let them ask. For God gives it to every man liberally and upbraided not. And the last verse is this. It is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. And God is trying to reveal some of the mysteries of the kingdom today. I know I may sound crazy, but this is what I'm asking you to do. Ask God, is there a marine kingdom? And if he tells you there's a marine kingdom, then you know I'm telling you the truth.
It's not nothing. I'm, I just picked up a couple of scriptures and I read. No. It's something that I had to fight. It's something that I've experienced. It's some things I've encountered. And I wish I can tell you more, but I, I'm not going to tell you anymore. I want you to do the research. I gave you enough scriptures to study. Stop looking at the commentaries. Them commentaries are only going to give you common understanding. You have to ask the God who functioned from the Spirit. The Holy Spirit will reveal it to you. Why? Because he revealed all truth. I told you this would not be part of our church curriculum. Our church messages that we normally hear is going to be something different. And God has charged me in this season, not only to teach my church, but to teach all those that will listen. That's why the Bible said those that have an ear to hear what the Spirit is saying, let them hear. Listen, I thank you for tuning in tonight on the Vision Channel on Merge. Do your homework. God has given you homework. Listen, I'll see you next Monday on Merge on the Vision Channel. You guys have a great night.